right, Ian Middle School, now is the time for us to go over to Mission Control. So let me go ahead and call out to them and have them speak up. Hi guys, I am Kelly Humphreys Kelly, and I, Are you there? I am here, Ryan, how are you guys doing? We're here in Mission Control, and I'm with Cassie Rodriguez, who is an operations support officer here that works on a lot of interesting things. Cassie, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, ready to answer some questions. Hey, first of all, tell us a little about yourself, where you're from, and what your job entails. Okay. Um, my name is Cassie Rodriguez. I was uh, born and raised in Corpus Christi, Texas, and I've been a flight controller here in Mission Control for about eight years. Um, I am a flight controller, and then I also get to train astronauts. And what I train them on is how to fix the space station. When the space station breaks, we need to do maintenance, just like you have to maintain your car, and if it breaks, you have to fix it. So we kind of have to teach them how to do that with the space station. Um, we also work on all the different mechanisms and um, docking parts of the space station. Since we built it in space, we had to meet all the, the parts in orbit, so our, my group was also responsible for that. Hey, can you come over to my house and help me with some plumbing problems? Um, I know some folks who can. <laughs> Great. Well, hey, thanks, Kathy. Uh, we, Cassie, we're uh, ready now for your questions there. Oh. <laughs> oh, I had one question. And my question is, is the universe infinite? Does it end? <laughs> I'm sorry, can you repeat your question? Is the universe infinite? Does it end? Does infinite end? <laughs> um, infinity? His question is, is the universe infinite? Is oh. there an ending to the universe? Um, that's a good question, you know, and I'm really interested to see if we can find that out. Um, you know, we think it goes pretty far, so the more satellites and vehicles that we're able to get out into space, we can try and push those boundaries and, and see how far it goes. You know, so. the, the space station has a, a special scientific instrument that actually is looking at answers to some of those questions. It's called the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. And what it does is it's looking at, at cosmic particles. It's collecting billions of them. So far, it's collected 18 billion particles, about a million. It's, it's doing about a million particles a month. And they're going to analyze all those particles. And they're, what they're looking for is evidence of dark matter in the universe. And dark matter is matter that we think is there, but we can't see it. Uh, or antimatter. You guys may have watched Star Trek and you heard about the antimatter engines and the dilithium crystals. Well, we do expect there to be antimatter out there and the alpha magnetic spectrometer is looking at whether or not that exists and, uh, and how much of it there is. And that should help us understand more about the universe and whether it's infinite. Thank you. My name is Hector, and I want to ask something. How long can you be in space before mus muscles and bones get weak? That's a good question, Hector. That's part of what we're trying to research on the space station. Uh, right now, our astronauts spend um, about six months at a time in space, and some of them get to go up for multiple trips. So um, what we do is there's tons of experiments that analyze the different effects that space will have on muscles and the bones and even on their eyes. So um, yeah, we're, we're researching that right now so that we can look towards longer duration trips like going to the moon or Mars for a longer time period. You know, interestingly enough, one of the guys that's on the space station right now, his name is Don Pettit. He just this week 
uh, marked a full year in space. He has three different missions. He's had two different space station missions, and he flew to the space station on the space shuttle once. And so altogether, he spent a more than a year in space already. And that's quite a lot of time if you can think about how long a year is. So, uh, but he loves it up there. And, uh, and the last time I talked to, to folks that had direct conversation with him, they said he wasn't sure he wanted to come home, but he's going to come home uh, this weekend anyway. Uh, and uh, so it, it, you can you can live quite a while on the space station and have a lot of fun doing it. Uh, but uh, there are limits, and we're looking seriously at uh, how long you can live there uh, by all these experiments we're doing. You know, the astronauts on board, uh, they, they, they draw blood from themselves. They collect urine samples just the way your doctor does when you're feeling bad. Uh, and they bring all those down and analyze them and try and figure out exactly how space is affecting their bodies so that we can find ways to work against that. You know, right now one of the chief ways we do that is the astronauts exercise about two and a half hours every day. They've got treadmills and they've got a uh, stationary bicycles and they've got a special exercise machine that makes it so they can all, it's like they're lifting weights, but of course in zero gravity there's no weight. And so they've got to use these resistance devices to pretend like they're lifting weights. And they do all those things to try to keep their bodies in good shape. Uh, and so we can see if they, that helps them uh, keep from losing as much muscle and bone density. And it also makes it so that it's easier for them when they come back to Earth uh, to readapt to living in gravity. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been out on a boat. Uh, I know there's lots of waterways uh, out in the El Paso area. When you've been on a boat for a long time, you know, and you get off back on the land, it feels a little bit funny. Well, the same thing happens, only it's even worse because when you go to space, all your fluids in your body, since there's no gravity to pull it down into your legs, uh, all your fluids pull up here into your torso. And then so the astronauts drink a whole lot of water before they come back to Earth so that they've got lots of volume uh, of liquids in their body and that it won't be so bad when all the fluids come back down into the legs once they've got gravity. So there are lots of issues you got to deal with when you live in space and especially when you're coming back from space to Earth. Okay, thank you. My name is Charlie. No, 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 it's Charlie. Okay, my name is Charlie. No, my name is Carlos. My name is Carlos. My question is, do you get sore after your exercise in space? That's a good question, Carlos. Um, I know the astronauts do sweat a lot, but I haven't heard them talk about soreness. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I got to admit, that's that's a new one on me. I have not heard whether or not they get sore, but I would imagine that you do because whenever you work out on the ground, you get sore. Um, and uh, if you had to work out two and a half hours a day like they do in space, I bet you it, it's sore. But on the flip side of that, you know, the rest of the time that they're up there that they're not exercising, they're not using their, their lower muscles and stuff a lot. And so it may, I, I'll have to ask them that. They, it may be worse because they don't use as many of the muscles all, uh, the rest of the time, or it may not be as bad because they're working out every day. My name is Natalie. My question is, can you get a simple cold shape Throw and stomach blue in space? That's a good question, Natalie. Yeah, um, the being in space is, is very, um, it's a little different from, from being down here. If you get a cold, you know, you can go to your doctor. Um, up in space, they might be susceptible to a little bit, um, you know, some of the dust and, and little changes in the environment up there since it's kind of like being in an airplane almost for a very long time. You don't get any um, fresh air from just opening the window. So some little things like that may um, they may cause some colds or allergies or that type of thing. Um, and so what they do is there's a special console here in Mission Control that they can talk to. Um, it's called the Surgeon Console or the Biomedical Engineer Console. And they help them um, with any colds or stomach flus or things that they might get up there in space. Yeah, but you know, the, the, the good part of that is that they're in an enclosed environment. And so, you know, here on the ground, the way diseases 
go back and forth from different people uh, is is you might run into somebody who has a cold and doesn't know it yet and you know you might shake their hand and it transfers the germs and you end up getting sick from that you don't have as many people that you're interacting with on the space station uh, you only see new people uh, when uh, another spacecraft comes delivering uh, the next group of crew members uh, or you might get uh, in contact with some kind of uh, uh, of, a, of a virus or an infectious agent uh, when one of the cargo ships comes up but we take great pains here on the ground to make sure that those are really clean and the disease free before we send them up because we don't want the crew members to get sick on orbit because uh, as it is when all those fluids come up into your body you tend to get a stuffy head and, and uh, anyway when you're in space at first after a while it ends up settling down but you don't want to make that any worse especially when when you're adapting to living in microgravity so uh, yeah you can catch them uh, and you know another interesting part of the research on the space station deals with things like uh, things that make us sick uh, they've been doing a lot of interesting research with uh, uh, things like bacteria uh, they collect samples on the surfaces of the space station on the inside and bring them back to look at to see if there's any bad bacteria grow on inside the space station. And then we also have special experiments that uh, look at uh, different kinds of bacteria in hopes that we can maybe develop ways to fight them here on the Earth and give benefits to people here uh, back on the planet. One of those is a bacteria called Salmonella. And Salmonella is a bacteria that causes food poisoning. I don't know if you've ever had food poisoning. I have. It is no fun. Uh, but uh, they, are, they found out that in microgravity aboard the space station, uh, those conditions are very similar to the conditions of when that bacteria gets in your intestines and, uh, and starts getting active and making you sick. And they actually identified the gene. I don't know if you guys have studied genes yet, but those are the d genetic makeup of, of our human bodies. They studied the genes of those bacteria and they found a switch that turns them on and off whether they're making you sick or not. And they're taking that information and they're trying to learn how they can make a vaccine so that maybe you could get a shot like uh, you get for other things when you're a kid uh, to protect you against things like polio and other diseases that would keep you from getting sick from food poisoning. And there's another really bad disease out there that happens when people are in hospitals. It's called MRSA. I think it's methostaphylistic. Uh, resistant bacteria but anyway it's a bad bacteria that uh, antibiotics don't work well against and so they're using the same technique to try and find if there's a vaccine that we can use against those kind of things so that you don't get sick uh, when when you come into contact with those thanks thank you my name is Kimberly right my name is Kimberly, and my question is, how will, you, how will an arctic animal live in space? That's a good question, Kimberly. How do, how do aquatic animals live in space? Um, that's, a, that's an excellent question, because we plan to have an experiment coming up here in um, the next couple of flights that are actually going to bring fish up to the space station, and we're going to get to observe how they live. So I'm actually not quite sure yet, but we're going to find out here pretty soon. But so. I bet you'll get to check for the leaks if there are any, right? That's very true. I'll fix it if it breaks. <laughs> <laughs> it's called the Aquatic Habitat, and it's going to launch on the next Japanese vehicle that goes up to the space station called Kanatori 3. Kanatori means white stork in Japanese. And it's also called the H2 Transfer Vehicle, which is shortened to uh, HTV. Uh, here at NASA, we have to shorten everything into initials. Uh, but anyway, that, that is scheduled to launch uh, next month to the space station. It's going to bring about seven tons of cargo to the space station and one piece of that cargo is this aquatic ha habitat and I believe the first fish that are going to be up there are called Madaka fish and they're really cool fish because you can see through them and you can see all the workings of the insides of their bodies uh, just with a TV camera and so they're going to do a lot of experiments with those and see how they swim around and and uh, you know things animals tend to react differ differently in the uh, 
microgravity of space because uh, there is no gravity. And we've had all kinds of different animals up there. We've, we've had mice, we've had uh, uh, spiders and butterflies, and it has really interesting effects on their behavior. Uh, the spiders, for example, you know how they, they built a flat web here on the ground. In space, they made a little sphere of a web. And it was really interesting to watch them build the web and trap uh, their prey, uh, the insects that we sent up to feed them. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jonathan. My question is, what kind of experiments are you conducting on animals and insects? That's a good question, Johnny. Um, I'm not as familiar with all the, the insects and animals. We did talk a little bit about the spiders and the butterflies that have flown up before, um, and we do have the fish coming up here shortly. Um, we also do plant experiments on board the space station, uh, which I think we've been doing a lot this um, past couple of months. They do a lot of different kinds of experiments with uh, all the different animals and plants. Uh, what they do is they use them as models for the human body. Uh, and this is common in research that they do on laboratories on the ground. They figure out how different animals' systems are like our human bodies, and then they use that to develop a model, that, uh, and they do different tests on the animals uh, because they know that they, those, th that part of the, the way the, astronaut, the, the animal's body works is very similar to our body. And so what they do is, is, is they will send them up and see how uh, microgravity affects them and they'll bring them back to the ground uh, after they've, they've been in space and uh, uh, they, they will uh, take samples of all of their tissues and they'll study exactly what the environment in space did to those tissues. And they look at bones and they look at muscles uh, and they look at their immune systems uh, and all sorts of things. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a little bit hard to describe exactly what they're doing, but, but the main purpose is to help us be healthier here on Earth and look at problems that we need to solve here on Earth for the humans. Uh, and we use the, the way that animals react uh, as, as, as kind of a surrogate or a pretend human so that we don't have to do some of those tests on humans. Thank you. My name is Leela. My question is, what do you do on your space time? What do we do on our space time? Was that the question? Spare. Oh, like astronauts. Spare, like astronauts. What do they do on their spare time? Oh, well, we have um, uh, some very, very smart astronauts up there in space right now. So um, in addition to all the experiments and work that um, the astronauts do right now on their spare time, um, they also like to kind of have some fun and do some experiments on their own. Um, some of the crew members have Legos up there, and they'll do little experiments with the Legos. and. Um, um, I think Don is, is the one that I'm thinking of the most. There. Yeah, Don Pettit is on the space station right now. He is kind of a super geek. Uh, and he, I mean, I, I think he could take two sticks and make a jet engine in his garage mm. back here on, on the Earth. But he's doing all sorts of uh, what he calls science off the sphere. And he's taken common household elements uh, and playing with them in space. Uh, for example, he, he took uh, some uh, white white paste, uh, li kind of a liquid paste, uh, and he put it on little bitty computer speakers. And then he played the computer speakers at different frequencies, and he saw how that stuff all reacted. And it was really weird looking if you looked at it, because it was this white finger of stuff that would come up from the speaker in the microgravity of space and move around. It looked kind of like one of the aliens in one of the movies you might have seen. It was really, really strange. And, and sometimes he'll... Uh, He'll, he'll put things
things into a uh, fluids into a little circle of wire and then he'll inject different kinds of dye into them and see how they swirl around and then he's also done some things with with uh, fluid spheres I don't know if you knew it, this, but in space, whenever you let out a, a drop of water, it forms a little globe. And uh, it's because of the surface tension effect that keeps it confined to that little globe. And he's done some really interesting things with syringes, and he'll, he'll, he'll make a bubble inside of one of those little globes of water, and then he'll make a, a bubble of water inside the bubble of air that's inside the bubble of water. And it's really fun to watch. Another thing he's been doing is growing plants on his own as an experiment. He has grown zucchini plants. I don't know if you guys like zucchini. I really like zucchini. But he grew a zucchini plant, and he also grew some sunflowers. And he's been taking care of them and actually writing a blog. And you can go off on the Internet and look up his blog. He's writing it as if he is the zucchini. And he says he feels very zucchini now that he's sprouted out and he's growing in space. He's had some issues with the sunflower. The sunflower was getting some fungus on it. And so he got very creative with that, and he used some antibacterial bacterial wipes that they have up there to clean up and he was kind of wiping the leaves on the sunflower and I think he got the sunflower feeling a lot more healthy but you might go check out that blog and learn uh, more about how Mr. Zucchini is doing in space. No, I'm sure they will do that Kelly. This is Ryan at the DLN and I just wanted to warn uh, everyone involved. Heads up that we have about four minutes left so I think we have time for two quick questions and two answers. How does the sh my name is Luis. How my question is, how does the shower work? Excellent question. Um, well, the crew does not have a shower like we have on the ground where you turn little spigots on your uh, wall and then the water comes gushing down. Um, we talked about the way water works in space. It forms little blobs and globes. Um, so what the crew does is they have a water dispenser and they'll maybe wet a towel and then they have to kind of give themselves sponge baths and um, they have special shampoo and soap that they use and that's how they uh, give themselves a shower. Yeah, they did some early testing with showers. There was the, the first space station that the United States and NASA launched was called Skylab. Uh, and that was back in the 70s, and uh, they had a shower on that, and they learned that it didn't work so well. And we did some testing to see if there was any value to doing that on the space station, and they just decided that in the long run it wasn't worth all of the water that cost. Water is a really precious commodity on board the International Space Station, and it's so precious even that, that here's the thing that it might gross you out a little bit, but that shower she was talking about, well, they're taking that shower with water that was recycled from their own urine. So when they go to the bathroom in space, in the toilet, it gets run through a system that basically uh, cleans the water and purifies it so that they can drink it, uh, rehydrate their food with it so they can eat it, and then they can also do all of their regular hygiene stuff. They can also take that water and make oxygen with it that they need on the space station. They split the hydrogen and the oxygen molecules from water, and they keep the oxygen on board, and they get the hydrogen dumped overboard. They even got a new experiment called I mean swing bed that is going to take that hydrogen and split it up and try and bring more water back into the space station so that they can re they, they have to deliver even less water. So we don't deliver a whole lot of water on the space station. We pretty much reuse the same stuff over and over again. And that guy Don Pettit that we were talking about, he calls it yesterday's coffee is tomorrow's coffee. All right, Thank we you. have time for one more question. We actually have two more minutes, so that's just enough time to do one quick question and an even quicker answer, and you can wrap up, Kelly. All right, thanks, Ryan. Hello, my name is Oscar. How do you cut your hair, brush your teeth, and change your clothes? Is it hard? Uh, excellent question, Oscar. So how they cut their hair. Um, so they have special attachments. There's a couple of ways you can do it. I guess you can just use scissors. But when you cut your hair, all those little strands are going to float away. So the crew actually has to have the vacuum cleaner close to them whenever they cut their hair. And there's special attachments that they can put on the vacuum cleaner so that when they do cut their hair, it automatically gets sucked up into the vacuum cleaner. 
Um, and then same with brushing their teeth. Um, I haven't seen them do it, but it looks like they do it kind of similar to the way they, they do here on the ground. But again, if any little parts that fly away, you got to just be prepared to, to capture them. Yeah, and so. you basically spit out the toothpaste into a towel or you swallow it. Yeah. All right, it seems we have about 30 seconds left, Kelly and Kathy. So if you want to say anything uh, inspiring to the students, now would be the time. Well, I'm going to let Cassie tell you her best advice for how to get involved in NASA. Yes, if you are interested in NASA, just continue working in math and science and um, research NASA. Go to www.nasa.gov and we have tons of information about experiments that you can do at home and um, do your best. Remember, okay. stay in school yes. and study stuff that you like and that will lead you to a life later on well, you'll be able to do what you want to do, whether it's working in a bank or working for NASA or whatever. But the main thing is to get a good education. That will help you later in life. All right. Well, thank you very very much, Kelly and Cassie. Uh, we'll say goodbye. Actually, I'll let, uh, I'll let uh, Guillaume Middle School say uh, goodbye. Maybe I'll say it. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Thanks for being with us. Bye.